Magnus Carlsen has played over 100 games using the London system, scoring just a little over 80% win rate, making him by far the leading expert of the opening. But how is he able to exterminate world class opponents with such a basic opening? This is pretty much how most people would play out the London system, but the biggest trick that Magnus uses to maximize his potential is the fact that he is not rushing with this pawn to c3 move. Now, I could go ahead and just show you the Magnus games, but since most of his opponents are very strong grandmasters, I don't really think that this is the most efficient method for you to learn. So instead, I will copy his opening while I'm walking you through four modern games that I have played against intermediate players, featuring the most important lines that Black can play against the London. The goal for this is to give you a realistic idea on how your games are gonna go while you are following the Magnus repertoire. For the research, I have used both his in-person and online games. Now, the only question remaining is... Are you ready? You don't look ready! And gonna be starting with Bishop onto the second move. Apparently, it is a Slav setup. Or he's trying to play the Karokan. Whatever it is, we're gonna be playing with E3. And normally, they play this with the Bishop out. So... I think we're gonna go knight f3, and what I've noticed uh, that uh, Magnus really loves to do against the setups with uh, the bishop onto f5, he is just literally going for c4. Okay, there's another approach of going bishop to d3, and then taking it with a pawn, uh, and play uh, perhaps like a slower game, but he's kind of really going aggressive here, idea being uh, to usually combine that uh, by playing quick queen to b3. As a quick observation, whenever black is playing for an early bishop on 2f5, you can use Magnus's favorite approach from the copycat, which is c4 followed by an early queen b3 targeting that pawn onto b7. Kind of no matter what move order they choose, the big concepts will generally work out the same. Now, back into the video. I think the uh, same rule applies here. You can pretty much think of it as, uh, well, the bishop left c8, meaning that the pawn on b7 is a little bit vulnerable. So, I'm gonna go queen to b3, and now they have uh, they have a choice. I'd say pretty much three main moves for black. I would expect uh, queen b6 to be most common, and there we have it. But they could also play b6 or queen to c8. Uh, in general, in these type of positions. Now... After queen to b6 here, you get to see why uh, playing c4 against this bishop f5 setup is so efficient. Simply because of the fact that uh, we can force um, endgame in our terms. So no, don't play queen dix on b6. Opening up his rook, that's quite comfortable for black. But instead, go c5 and invite him to take on b3 and activate our rook. So... This is already very pleasant, and uh, I think you're gonna be doing quite okay just by remembering this rule. But once you get this position on the board, it kind of uh, opens up a portal to like a new dimension. You have no idea how many interesting uh, positional ideas we have. So opponent plays knight bd7. I was kind of having ideas at some point to take and uh, collect the pawn. Also, another move for him, taking on b1. In my opinion, doing this trade in uh, this type of endgames, I think, is something black should be doing. Because the bishop, despite it looking very active, it runs the risk of uh, just sit on the board and not doing anything. It's just kind of, uh, fine, a good bishop, but what good is a good bishop for if the bishop doesn't uh, target anything? So, uh... Chess is hard, bro. As simple as that. Like, you just think you're playing a game, you're getting an active piece. But, uh, you know, if you, let's say, zoom out a little bit, is this bishop really doing all that much? So, uh, yeah, we're not gonna, like, overthink uh, that too much right now. I just kind of wanted to introduce you to this little concept. And since knight h5 can be quite annoying in these positions, that is pretty much the only positional threat that he has. I'm gonna go h3. It's pretty funny that computer nowadays uh, even uh, considers a move like h4, just getting, trying to be a little bit more efficient, getting even uh, that 
a slight extra space. But I think H3, just the classical move, is very good. This is kind of my favorite. And okay, opponent plays bishop e7. I'm gonna go b4. I'm gonna be honest, he's doing it uh, kind of inaccurate. He had to play a6, rook c8. Because now on a6, I can already break with b5. Okay, now if I play b5, b takes on c6, and then bishop a6. We're just winning with bishop b7 incoming. Should we go for the immediate win just like that? Do you guys want to see that? Or should I give him a chance to play bishop e2, a6, so that uh, I can show you how to maneuver in that position? Uh, I think right now I'm just going to go b5 and punish him. But I will show you after the game uh, the key ideas in case he would have stopped us from playing it. So... Uh, let's go for it. Already threatening to win on the spot with BC, like a lot of you may be underestimating this threat. They're just kind of forcing resignation. And I have to say, Magnus has a lot of very instructive games in this structure. Obviously, uh, his uh, world-class opposition always has this setup being kind of more solid. Uh, but uh, White is doing quite well regardless. Um, and we see 94. 94 is the kind of active move that's actually not doing anything. So I'm just going to take and I'm going to play bishop there. This is the move that uh, everybody is missing. And they think, oh, how is this a threat? Because I play bishop b7, I can go there. Can you? Hello there. Good morning. There's a bishop onto f4. So, yeah, I think this position is already completely winning for white and... Uh, it's just going to be a little bit uh, a matter of technique, as they say. Uh, you may not believe me. I guess uh, it will take <laughs> a few moves to prove that. But as funny as it may look, there is genuinely no way to stop this from coming. Taking the pawn on c6, your rook has to move. Take the pawn on a7, g5. Just kind of like a nice confusing move, but we don't care. I'm going to go there saying, still... You have the same issues. G5 is just um, kind of like a bluff. You know, I'm going to go G5, act like I'm trying to do something. Uh, well, no, you're not. Uh, still, your position is uh, really bad. So, uh, yeah, it's just like um, you're trying to cool down a fire by uh, <laughs> just uh, using a little bit of uh, water. Uh, you know, just uh, not going to be very effective. So bishop to b7. Now my opponent's position is, yeah, completely ruined. And what I really love about this is that look at the sniper on h2. Just that's pretty much the game changer. This bishop is actually the real MVP here. And he had to play rook e8. Now I can take this. I can take this. I think I like this better just because it's doing uh, a pin as well. And after knight c3, I got uh, a choice. I could take this or I could take keeping the pin. Uh, so if this rook d8, no, I, I think just simple play, improving my center as well. Okay, <laughs> knight x on c5. I guess... Uh, Opponent has an idea. Mm. That's actually not so bad. I'm going to give him credits because I thought he just uh, blundered. But no, he wants to play it for the fork. I'm still like completely winning in all variations. But I think we just start by taking the rook. So take the rook. He probably takes. And now take the knight. I think it's easiest. Right? I mean... I got an exchange, but if I take the knight, I'm going to take two pieces. So he's going to go for this, checking me. Important that you go uh, up. So rook uh, is defending the other rook. I have an extra rook, so he has to take. And uh, after that, I'm going to be up a full piece. So he has only one pawn for uh, the piece, but uh, yeah, I'm going to defend my pawn. And then this seems uh, to be <laughs> uh, collapsing soon as well can bring my knight, for instance. Just look at this bishop. Whole game, the good bishop, that's doing nothing. So, uh, 
I mean, I'm just threatening to take and double up his structure. And really, all you had to do was remember quick c4 against that bishop onto f5, followed by queen to b3, and when they go for queen b6, you have to force the trade in your uh, own terms. So I'm going to go here, threatening the pawn, but also threatening to exchange more pieces. Always uh, look for uh, multi-purpose moves. Uh, can we just trap his rook for fun? That would be pretty hilarious. Uh, yeah, I'm going to trap his rook for fun. I mean, I could also check and then play c6. I think this one is even more effective. He cannot go to f8 because I had discovery. Uh, but after that, I think there is no way to stop the pawn. So... Here again, his bishop is completely useless. Obviously, it helps that we have the extra piece. But um, just... Okay, just pause for a second. Think about it. That my opponent is genuinely 1700. So, I mean, he's not bad. I mean, if we go over his profile, in fact... If it shows us uh, the percentile... Like here in Rapid, he's better than 99% of you watching, I guess. This guy is pretty good. Have you seen how effortlessly we managed to win? Just by knowing a simple idea. C4, Queen to B3, which is Magnus's favorite way of dealing with uh, Bishop to F5 kind of lines. Now, to show you the key idea that uh, I wanted... He is supposed to do a6, b4, and now rook c8, so that we no longer get in quick b5. And the point is that after h3, e6, the key maneuver to remember is that, uh, well, you gotta start in ID2. Okay, why do we play in ID2? That is completely pointless to me. I don't understand that. Well, to give you a summary, the weakest uh, spot in Black's camp is the b7 pawn. That's kind of what you need to remember about this variation. So knight to d2, already preparing a journey to the a5 square. And just imagine opponent is careless, take castle. Knight a5, you pretty much have no way to defend that. Because the bishop covers everything. So white just wins. Now, additionally, you may be wondering, all right, genius, but what if bishop to d8? Just getting ready to snipe the knight when it gets there. Well, that is actually played in quite a lot of games. And the idea is that after bishop takes on a5, I want you guys to really type it now in the comments. What do you think is the best recapture? Should you take it back with a rook or with a pawn? And which one is better? And I can tell you that in this position, Magnus had this countless times and he always played the move. Pawn takes on a5. How does this make any sense? We take with a pawn. I feel like we need to keep uh, open rook. Well, it turns out that after pawn takes, we are able to swing the rook over and get that juicy pressure on b7. In fact, how you're going to be winning this kind of positions is, let's say he castles, you play uh, like, uh, I don't know, throwing bishop d6, rook e8, bishop e2, e5, rook a4. He can take, that's like fine. And black realizes that you're trying to do this. So they play like rook eight, rook before, rook a seven. Okay. Now we could play king d2, keeping king in the center. It's useful. And a lot of my games have gone like knight e4, knight takes, bishop takes, f3, bishop goes back, and then you can genuinely just play rook a1, rook a3, rook b3. And you're simply going to be collecting that juicy pawn on b7, and with that, the game. Yo, Alex Banzea, I love the energy, but how are you so handsome and clever in the same time? Well, first of all, thank you. I get that a lot, especially when I visit my parents. But I'm going to be honest, I'm not here trying to reinvent the wheel. I am presenting you with the facts, because this has actually already been played in a game between Magnus and your favorite Chesbra. Maybe debatable, Eric Hansen. Just take a look at the position that will appear on the screen. Ha! Huh, pretty similar, I know. 
Now, what shook me the most while I was doing research is the fact that in this position, Magnus's favorite move is to go for knight to c3, simply transposing into the Jabava. I mean, what is up with this mixed signals, Magnus boy? Obviously, this got me both very confused and excited in the same time, so I had to check out some statistics and apparently, according to Leeches, knight to c3 seems to be by far the best performing move, sitting at a 60% win rate according to all the games played on the website. So, naturally, I had to give it a try. Let's see what happened in my game. Da -da -da, da -da. Oh, <laughs> right, everybody getting another game with white pieces. I barely noticed until my clock was really ticking, so uh, one probably thought uh, I'm a weirdo. Anyways, uh, he is playing the move pawn to d5, and we're gonna start uh, the Magnus style. Early bishop to f4. And okay, we see the early c5. According to my research, Magnus mainly plays e3. He rarely goes for c3, uh, kind of getting back into the uh, exchange slav after cd, cd, but uh, this is his main move. In case you've been waiting to get any of my chessable courses, both London System and Karogan are now on a sale, I guess, for about two more days when you see this. Back into the video. Just defending and uh, it is very important that uh, whenever black goes for a move like uh, c5, you have the opportunity of taking back on d4 uh, with a pawn. That's a pretty important concept that uh, a lot of beginners uh, are kind of having a hard time uh, understanding. So, uh, okay. We see knight to c6, and now pretty much uh, we have a choice. We could play c3, just uh, going for a normal London kind of play, uh, or we can play uh, something that uh, Magnus does quite a bit against the c5 line. So uh, he's really in love with this idea of transposing back into the Jobava London, which is... Taking by surprise a lot of the black folks because knight b5 is already a threat that could potentially win you the game just like that. So knight f6 already. Look, 1600 rated guy. This is just so unexpected because now you just lose the game. It's like opponent plays normal London. You're feeling, uh, uh, I'm facing this shit again. Just gonna be a slow, boring, maneuvering game. And before you know, Magnus goes for this sneaky knight c3. <laughs> you don't even realize that you're back into the Jubava London and then this knight b5 kind of happens and uh, now of course you start uh, <laughs> throwing uh, your stuff in the room. You go completely mad because uh, move 5, you can already resign as black. Um, simply no ways to keep a semi-decent position. Uh, like, he has to throw in e5, but uh, it gets bad, bad. You'll see. I guess we'll just have to wait a little bit for my opponent uh, <laughs> to play a move. Okay, now, very important detail, though. Whenever you're considering uh, whether to play this knight b5 move or not, it has to be defended, okay? If you start uh, with a normal uh, London move order, you're kind of always going to have e3. I'm addressing more... Uh, the guys that uh, already like to follow me and uh, they start always with Jobava London. So, key idea when you go for knight b5, make sure it's defended so that you're not vulnerable to queen a5 idea and you have nothing better than going back with a knight. That would be pretty odd. So, knight to b5 and... <laughs> okay, your opponent uh, probably went outside to buy uh, cigarettes or some juice or something because... He doesn't seem to make uh, any moves, but uh, I'm going to wait a little bit. I'm going to come back uh, from the future. Okay, no need for me to actually edit that since first second I say it, bishop lands on g4. f3. Simple move. Perhaps it should have been an exercise for you, but uh, yeah, I mean, he attacks my queen. I just have to uh, come and make another... Um, stronger threat since playing something kind of passive and goofy like knight f3 gives him time to play uh, rook c8 and defend yeah but he plays it regardless okay plays rook c8 defending against 97 but 
Did my opponent notice that I'm just literally threatening to win his bishop? He probably forgot about that. Uh, okay, we are completely winning, but still it's a bit of a weird, messy position that if uh, you relax, you could still uh, easily lose, I feel like. So, uh, gotta keep your head in the game and I think it's important. Okay, knight e4. Knight f3 comes to mind as the most tempting move. Now, additionally, because he has a strong knight, uh, instinctively I'm looking for ways to immediately get rid of it. Okay, you cannot leave such a uh, let uh, such a strong knight uh, live in your uh, camp completely rent free. So I would really love to play knight c3. The only problem with knight c3 is what happens if he pins. Queen a5 pinning uh, the knight to the king. That's a little bit annoying. So, for this reason, does it make sense to start bishop to d3? Idea to just take like that? I kind of like that. You know what? I think I may just start with it. Threatening this and threatening to take the pawn. If check. Okay, there we have it. I can go knight back. Sacrificing a pawn, but uh, we already have one apiece. I could also play the move c3. However, the issue with c3 is that after a6, my knight is getting uh, kind of trapped. That's not very nice. So, okay, I think I'm just going to go knight c3, knight c3, pawn c3, queen takes c3, and then don't play queen d2 because that would blunder the rook. But uh, after that... I think you can just go king f1, and after cd4, you could take, but even nicer, you have 92 tempo move. So, uh, yeah. Alternatively, after knight c3, always you should consider queen to d2, pinning the knight, but it's not an effective move here since the queen is already defended. So, we'll just have to follow that line. He's gonna take with check, and by elimination, king f1 seems to be uh, the best uh, move. King f2 could be interesting, but uh, I feel like after takes, my king could potentially get checked on diagonal. So for this reason, f1 just feels safer. Uh, e2 is not good because it's uh, occupying knight square. So I'm thinking this takes and then knight e2 strong intermediate move, attacking the queen and the pawn, expecting him to maybe go back to c5. We have ed4 and notice that he's unable to go knight takes, knight takes, queen takes. Why? Because we have bishop to b5 check, discovery, king moves, and then there's gonna be a free queen waiting for us to collect it. So, uh, gotta play king f1, not king f2, because in that line the queen on d4 would have checked me. So, you have saw how this move is instantly beneficial uh, for us. So, uh, yeah, just gonna do this. 92. Do not take because he would have simply recaptured. So important to throw in this move. Developing with tempo. Whenever you can develop uh, with tempo, that is usually a pretty good move. Alternatively, he could go there, 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 and there. These are the moves. But I think he'll try to stay in touch with d4 square. So to me, I'm guessing he'll mainly play uh, one of these moves. Uh, okay, I'm going to play one of these moves and... I'm going to try to attack these knights. <laughs> that was just a pretty poor impersonation of uh, GM Hikaru. Apologies for that. But um, I have recently watched a Hans Niemann video impersonating Hikaru, and that was pretty funny. I highly advise you uh, watch uh, that one. Uh, it, it gave me a good laugh. So knight to e2, targeting the queen and trying to take the juicer. What is my opponent going to play? He's tanking. He seems to be really emotionally involved, really trying to come back uh, and not lose uh, in such silly fashion after the typical Jabava London trap. So I'm just going to take, could have taken with a knight, but it would have given me quite an odd pawn structure. So uh, I'd rather slow down a little bit here and uh, get more of like a normal game. He is probably either going to go aggressive, but I have at least check, or he's going to play e6. These are uh, the candidates. Now, on e6, I would really love to exchange queens. That would be uh, something that if we can achieve it, you're going to be winning the game in 99% of the times. 
uh, because you're up a piece. Any queen trade, uh, getting your opponent to the end game is just going to reduce his kind of play. However, we do see the move pawn to f6. Obviously threatening to push e5. How should we uh, refute that? Well, we could try simple development, I guess. Let's say uh, h3, king g1 there and castle by hand, but uh, I don't want to give him uh, activity. So I'm looking for concrete moves, pretty much, on f6. I see pretty much in order to stop this, either bishop b5 to pin him, can be one move, and then trade the knight. But I kind of don't want to give up my precious bishop, just look how this bishop is controlling all the squares, defending this pawn. I don't want to trade it for a knight. And alternatively, I'm looking bishop f5 targeting the rook. Um, rook has to move. I assume he's going to keep the rook closer to the middle. And then I was thinking whether we could plant the bishop on e6. And he almost has no moves. He's completely paralyzed. So that's a yes, yes for me. <laughs> so perhaps this sequence, it's not very easy to find. And if in your games, uh, let's say you play something slow like c3, e5, and then maybe you just go back. That is keeping a winning position. That is fine. But... What I'm teaching you here is basically this concept of identifying your opponent's threat and playing prophylactical chess. Notice how now this bishop, uh, you can almost uh, hear it screaming in pain. It's like, look at this. He plays g5, targeting my bishop. I could go bishop c7, keeping the pressure. I could also go back. Um, and you know, life is good. Do I want to go uh, to c7? Because after Rook goes, he's going to have knight d8 idea. So perhaps that's helping him. But on the other hand, after Rook there, the pawn is going to remain undefended. And that is something for us uh, to grab. Something for us to eat. We gotta feed the kids and play bishop c7, I guess. And explaining this move, and what I wanted to say is that just look at how stupid my opponent's dark square bishop really is. He cannot develop this diagonal because of the pawn. He cannot go like anywhere because of these pawns. I mean, this bishop is like so ugly, not even his uh, mother loves him. He's just this bad. So, okay, I can take this. I can also be evil and play rook d1, trying to take that, potentially inducing a b6 move and then bishop d5 pins the knight. A kind of decisive effect. So I think rook b1 is even uh, more annoying. Now, rook b1, can he perhaps go for counterattack? Trying to get rid of my bishop. That would be the only resource to watch out for. So for this reason, maybe queen b1 could be interesting. As he doesn't have a very easy way to defend. But you know what? What if this is the kind of position where we are supposed to just go queen d3 and play for complete domination? Okay, since my king is pretty weak, I think uh, that is a very clever decision. So, yes, I could try to go ahead and uh, pick up the pawns and all that, but it's not like the pawns are running anywhere. It's not like my opponent has any threats whatsoever. Therefore, I have this luxury of uh, just uh, trying to reduce uh, the smallest chance of counterplay. Smallest just chance of counterplay was the queen getting a little bit excited over there. So I don't want that. And uh, my goal is to play rook b1. My rook is under attack, so I can defend my rook in a way that's also going to be threatening rook b1 next. With a move king f2, connecting the rooks. Notice how rooks are defending each other. Very nice. And yeah, one of them is about to come to b1, take on b7. Then when you take on d5, it's pretty much uh, going to be hitting these two pieces. This is just getting uh, very beautiful. And same thing. Look at that bishop. Look at h5. Just desperado. Now, you pause the video and you let me know which rook is the best to come onto b1. Should you bring this rook? Or should you perhaps bring the other one? I mean, it just looks like both of them uh, are trapping the queen. But which one is better? Well, you should open up your eyes, bozo, and go for checkmate in one. That is way better. Okay. That is just a little bit better. Let's act like this didn't happen, okay? 
let's act like, I mean, I bet nobody would get too excited about trapping the queen and missing checkmate in one. Like, you guys are probably not like this, right? I'm just, I'm just going a little bit crazy here with uh, my thing. I'm just trying to act too clever like I already do, so... Okay, what did we just see happening in this game? How did we get such a winning position so easily? And uh, why is this Magnus idea so good? Well, it is specifically that after c5, when you're playing the Jubava London, you're getting a huge threat of uh, landing the knight on b5. Why is this so strong uh, specifically against uh, c5 lines? Well... Just to make a little comparison with um, a normal line, yeah, like e6. Let's say you go knight b5 now, which is totally fine. I recommend that in my uh, <laughs> and speed runs. But one detail to kind of open your eyes about that idea is here in all these lines, black can get rid of your knight. With opponent c5, that is not that easy to do. It's like almost impossible sometimes. So... Because they play with c5, this makes uh, the b5 square a little bit more vulnerable. And uh, in order to get uh, like a reasonable game, a lot of the times black needs to uh, do something like a6. Which sometimes allows dc5. Or if they go a6, then this gets to other variations where uh, Magnus likes knight f3 and quick knight e5 plan. If you made it this far into the video, this means you really want to improve your chess or you just have a very big procrastination problem, no matter uh, what the reason is, I want to mention that the following game is by far the most important if you find uh, yourself uh, within this rating range of uh, 400 to maybe 1600, simply because the following opening will be one of the most common that uh, you're going to be uh, running against. So I'm specifically talking about... Uh, the Chigorin, okay? You can normally see the Chigorin by black playing knight to c6 onto the second move. For our experiment, okay, trying to see how Magnus will react against this, it was almost impossible uh, to get the feedback. However, luckily I was able to find uh, one game played on his uh, Leeches account, Dr. Nickterstein in Bullet. Simply because, you know, opponents of Magnus's caliber don't play uh, such an inferior opening, okay? It is a very well-known uh, uh, theoretical idea that in closed positions, such as the one starting after d4, uh, d5, uh, the knight placed in front of the c-pawn uh, is already kind of a positional mistake simply because they won't be able to strike into the center, okay? Like, black would love to put this pawn onto c5, However, it just does not work like that, or at least not in this patch. So, after this, Magnus likes to play e3, and in his game, after bishop to f5, a lot of you may already be freaking out, thinking that, oh, he's getting knight b4, knight x on c2, you may already have bad nightmares with that happening. And I get that most of you would go for the move pawn to c3. Trying to stop that. Well, c3 is not a mistake in itself. It is definitely not uh, the most efficient way uh, to deal with this. And perhaps we can uh, both learn from uh, what Magnus did. Which was uh, one of those uh, typical sigma moments by Magnus. Completely ignoring the threat. Just going c4. He's basically inviting black. Setting up a trap if you want. Please go knight b4. Magnus is saying, with a Norwegian accent, because I got something hidden in the pocket. Queen to a4 check. Saying hello to this knight, you have nothing better than going back. And not only that, uh, you're not going to be having any threats anymore, but you're vulnerable to c takes on d5. And after queen takes on d5, only move. Knight c3 comes with a tempo. Queen has to go back. And already he can do PP on the PP, got the knight, push your pawn and win the game on the spot. This has already happened in countless of games. So to sum things up here before uh, we jump into my actual game of using uh, Magnus's idea. C4 works as a great move whenever you notice that 
uh, Black's knight is placed uh, on c6 in front of the c7 pawn, okay? These uh, two have to be combined in your brain uh, to work uh, very well. But in my game, the situation uh, got even crazier because my opponent has played something very common, especially for online players, uh, which is the move uh, pawn to f6. Preparing both ideas of e5 and uh, perhaps chasing down my bishop? Well, let's see how I uh, reacted against that. And when f6 gets played, uh, that's pretty much an indicator that my opponent is going e5. So if I do c4, I have to be uh, ready for e5. And uh, the question is really how the position after cd5, ef, dc6 really is. It appears to be rather messy, but I kind of like it. Alternatively, I could start knight f3. Uh, trying to stop him from playing e5, but he could kind of double down on the idea and play bishop g4, which is what's uh, slightly concerning me. Uh, h3 takes takes e5. That could perhaps be a variation. Uh, but I think I'm just gonna play c4. It really looks like a Magnus kind of move here. If dc bishop takes developing, uh, that definitely helps us. If e6, we're more than happy to face a passive setup by my opponent, but yeah, e5 was really the biggest candidate. So, okay, I said this has to be the main move. Of course, you get throw in de, but I'm not really sure how that will help, since he can just recapture. And notice that throwing in the check doesn't seem to be very effective as black can simply play a move such as g6. So cd5 with the idea to develop his queen and then start attacking it with knight c3 seems rather appealing to me. Alternatively, de5, fe, cd5, ef4, dc6. I'm not super sure about uh, the send game. That's kind of like the main thing. Uh, even though we may be up a pawn somehow, the bishop pair in an open position becomes pretty strong for my opponent. So just because of that, I'd rather have same possession while having queens on the board. The main argument being that, uh, well, the move pawn to f6 makes my opponent's king kind of weaker in the long run, just because uh, he will have a harder time castling since we will pretty much uh, occupy uh, that diagonal uh, in the near future, I guess. So... Uh, yeah, that's a little bit of my thinking process uh, behind that. Alternatively, queen d5 could be played and after knight c3, bishop to b4. However, I was quite happy after seeing de5, queen d1, uh, rook d1, fe, and then maybe just a bishop move somewhere, uh, either g3 or g5. And even though this is an endgame, uh, I do have uh, my bishop pair still. Uh, and I also think we get a uh, bit of a lead in uh, development. So uh, I'm quite okay playing that. Um, those are the alternatives. Since after knight c3, if he goes back with a queen, say queen goes home to d8, after the e5, I think we're definitely ahead uh, out of this race. Because it just uh, is going to waste too many moves uh, aimlessly <laughs> running the queen down the board. So already my opponent uh, hopefully thinking and not turning on the engine. Uh, I guess we're about to find out uh, in the next couple of moves. Uh, <laughs> we can uh, quickly feel the level of his play. Uh, but yeah, I think those are pretty much the main moves. And uh, considering other things, it's basically overthinking so uh, here indeed we have this and this okay time to pause for a little bit the simple move is recapture now does it make sense to consider cb7 i don't really think so uh because he can always throw an intermediate move and uh I don't see how we could potentially benefit from having the king uh, onto f2. Uh, like, for instance, yes, maybe he recaptures, then you go knight f3. Perhaps you can make an argument that uh, bishop c4, rook e1 check comes quicker. Hmm. Call me crazy, but that's, uh, that's a little bit interesting. 
However, just taking BC, uh, I guess we have uh, even pawns in that position and he's full of weaknesses. That's a little bit easier, so I'm just going to keep it very simple and uh, no need to uh, go for fancy king walk early on in the game. Uh, at least uh, unless you don't have to. So knights are going to natural squares. I guess bishop to c4. Just taking advantage of this weakened diagonal by the uh, f6 move of my opponent. And then uh, probably we go uh, short castle and then rook c1. So notice how both rooks are heading towards the uh, semi-open files. Then we can find the square for the queen. It's not that difficult. Perhaps e2, perhaps b3, uh, perhaps a4 targeting the pawn. But what I like about this position is that our development is uh, pretty simple, no matter what he does. And against the check, I'm just going to continue. Uh, it's important that uh, you kind of have this goal uh, in your mind. And then uh, you just look for ways to punish potentially stupid moves by uh, your opponent. So he plays knight e7. I don't understand uh, why he has uh, a fetish for living with that pawn on c6 uh, when he could have taken it for like two moves already. But it really makes me uh, wonder, can't we just take on b7? I mean, he's almost blundering on the spot after queen a4. Luckily, he still has knight to c6. But I could really think of ways to start putting pressure onto that pin. Um, so for him, in order to this uh, be rather safe, he has to throw in bishop takes on c3 with check. And after pawn takes, bishop takes on b7. Uh, yeah, I mean, it feels pretty risky for my opponent. I'm going to give you that. Mm, what else? I could simply play knight f3. And after castle, that is a blunder because queen b3... Almost win the bishop, he still, uh, he still has 95. CP7 is uh, very tempting, but on the other hand, not sure I want to activate his bishop onto this diagonal. So, yeah, I think I'm just going to be crazy and I'm going to keep developing. For some reason, uh, to me, it felt like uh, developing his bishop was uh, not required. But, uh, yeah, I think taking was... A reasonable move. Definitely not a mistake. I'm just going to stick with my simple plan. Castle, queen b3 looks very nasty. If takes and then castle, then I may really take. <laughs> and first issue. No, actually in that position, queen b3 is precise. Give a check. He sort of has to move the king because knight d5, bishop c4 uh, or something like that. Uh, oh no, actually just cb7 wins. So yeah, he does none of that uh, because I think it was uh, problematic. So, he just recaptures. I'm going to develop the bishop where I promised. Making sure he's unable to castle. And I'm going to go there. I'm going to go rook c1. He may be castling himself. Um, perhaps onto the long side. Trying like this. It's still quite slow. So, we may have ways to uh, punish him immediately. Like, let's say bishop g4, castle, queen d7. I see a move such as knight d5 being very interesting just because we will no longer be pinned. So knight d5 looks problematic for him. If uh, you're feeling that uh, the pawn on e3 is quite soft and that gives you a little bit of anxiety, well, I don't think my opponent really has uh, ways to uh, attack the pawn like, yes, maybe queen e7, but whenever he does something like that, we can uh, easily protect it. Maybe queen e2 castle and perhaps the queen could become a target later on to moves such as knight d5. He's probably afraid that we are playing the London system like Magnus, so uh, definitely something to be aware of. Bishop g4 castling, now notice how knight d5 uh, becomes quite a huge threat, so perhaps it would be uh, somewhat sensible for him to consider bishop takes on c3, but whenever that happens, it is only uh, improving our center. And uh, I think already we see a losing move on the board. So please feel free to uh, go ahead, pause the video. I uh, challenge you to um, find the winning move. I'm actually looking for my wooden spoon because I have just uh, cleaned up the office, but I'm unable to find my wooden spoon just in case you're missing the move. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's probably in the kitchen. 
who keeps the wooden spoon in the kitchen. That is pretty crazy. So uh, we do have to play queen to a4. Uh, sadly, I don't have anything near uh, me to reward you for finding the best move. But um, I guess you just have my unconditioned love uh, for that. So queen to a4. This pretty much threatens to win the bishop and defend my own bishop. So his idea was to target my bishop. But notice how effective it is to not retreat like a monkey, but give a check uh, like a chicken. So we go here, has to go back, and then we actually get to deliver the punchline of the variation. Uh, you can still take your time uh, if you haven't found this yet. Uh, because now the bishop is defended, and the move like bishop b5 seems rather slow. Giving him bishop c3 and maybe kind of complicating. So d5... PP on the PP, we got a pressure on the knight, we got to increase uh, uh, the pressure on pin pieces. Okay, very simple stuff, very basic. I developed, like, literally, I told you what I was about to do here on move 7. 7 moves later, we're doing exactly that, and the opponent just gives the win. This is how a lot of these games will genuinely go. No matter that you're like 1600, 17, 1800 online, um, these ratings are still very easy. He tries to go for the cheeky b5, but the bishop remains undefended, so that doesn't work. I'm just going to take it and, uh, ooh, he goes there. Now, opponent is like uh, thinking, we're going to be recapturing and uh, he's going to outsmart us. Bang! b5. Well, not even that works since at the very least I have... Bishop f7 check, and then hello. Notice how the queen can actually capture his bishop. But there's something even stronger. You can go intermezzo. Bang! Look at this. Instantly resigns. Did you see that? That is pretty cool, isn't it? The following game is gonna be the cherry on top of the cake because... We're going to witness how Magnus Carlsen absolutely demolishes the King's Indian setup with a win rate over 90%. And guess what he plays in his possession? He's not playing the classical London. He goes yet again for the Jobava whenever he starts with the early London. Then he plays knight c3. Whenever he sees the Fianchero, he wants to get that move in creating a concrete threat of pushing e4, setting up a massive center. At this point, I was feeling pretty lost. Why would a man start with a normal London and transpose to the Jibaba all the time? I don't get it. Why don't you just play knight c3 right away? So in order to uh, solve this mystery, I feel like there is really uh, no other choice than going over his Instagram and try to call him directly. Yo, look at his profile. That's pretty crazy. Do you see these massive chess pieces? That's actually pretty insane. He's also been playing tons of goals recently. This means he's going to be thrilled uh, to see our message. Time to jump into the action. Let's message him. Hey, what is up, my boy Magneto? You know, I was just sort of having a chess question, if you don't mind. I noticed that you sort of learned how the knight moves and now you're just transposing back into the Jabava London all the time. What is up with that? I couldn't have really phrased it like that. Now we simply had to wait. He didn't get back on me on that, so I panicked. The main difference being that after knight to c3, this very much creates a threat of uh, occupying the center with pawns, which happens to not be the most typical idea for a true London system player, but it is very effective when you are dealing with uh, the Fianchero. So, gonna be playing e4, and the opponent can castle or play pawn to d6, usually. Uh, idea is that uh, e5 is pretty annoying, so they will generally try to start with that move. And here we have a very interesting position where uh, if you have already been following the channel, you have probably seen me play uh, the uh, interesting and uh, somewhat goofy move e5, which is just uh, going to give you millions of free wins after d5, d5, people entering the endgame, and then you can play knight to d5 with a 
devastating attack against E7. However, let me tell you the bad news, okay? Are you ready? You have to sit down uh, to take the bad news because sadly, Magnus does not seem to implement that strategy and he is more of a fan of simply going queen to detail, playing it the old school way, the classical approach, going for long castle, playing for bishop h6. And uh, my opponent decided to uh, go for what I think most of your opponents will, which is castling immediately. Uh, however, I think it's important to mention that another interesting plan for black is to delay castling by playing c6. And after bishop h6, you could take uh, white takes to the queen and then you have many moves like pawn to e5 or queen a5, leading to a somewhat uh, different game. Because my uh, general opinion, whenever black is rushing with castling, I think it gives us uh, a very clear target. So... We're going to be going for checkmate. We start by castling long and now they have a choice. And my opponent plays rook to e8. This could be played uh, for many reasons. One of them, uh, they are preparing e5 push. But I don't think that's really the main idea here. Because we can just take a notice that recapturing would be real bad. Because of queen takes on d8. So I think he's more so... Preparing to meet bishop h6 with bishop to h8, uh, which uh, somebody actually asked uh, me uh, in the comments to one of my recent videos of why I did not try to do something like that as black. Um, this is like an interesting idea to preserve your bishop, but uh, it is also quite time consuming. So I don't think this will fully solve black's issues at all. So... We have a choice between this or between uh, playing h4 or between playing f3. But for now, I think I'm just going to go pawn to f3. Simply waiting, saying that he cannot go e5 because I'm just going to go de. And on c6, I'm going to do the bishop move now. And I think here we'll have a bingo moment where he plays bishop h8, okay? See, this is the reason why he went rook e8. Because with the rook there, I could have captured. So he really had this kind of plan uh, before. Now it is time to just push uh, Harry the h pawn. I think in these positions, usually you don't need to play uh, g4 first because uh, it turns out that our attack is even quicker by sacrificing the spawn. So what you should really understand uh, about uh, the kind of game that we have right now, since it's not very typical for, let's say, like a true London system player. Uh, usually in the normal London, the game is a little bit slower. But here, you can notice that we have uh, opposite castles. So when there are opposite castles like this, it is pretty much all about who can grab the initiative and deliver an attack. So uh, material balance is, let's say, less important as long as one side is having a huge attack. Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure you get that by now. Uh, so my opponent will try to do this, and I'm going to do uh, the push on the other side. And from a theoretical point of view, white should be much better in these type of positions because uh, the biggest drawback uh, with my opponent's opening is that, sure, he can, like, get in the pawns, he can push that, but in the same time, these pawns need to be uh, backed up by pieces. So it just looks like uh, he's creating some threats, but... There is pretty much uh, no fundament uh, behind that. So I'm just going to go h5. And this is already like a very typical blunder, okay? If they take, that's like immediately resigning. Uh, pause the video, try to find why. Uh, it happens all the time. Hopefully he won't fall for such simple trick and he will just keep uh, doing his thing over there. <laughs> uh, before, I'm just going to like move the knight. Uh, honestly, even knight b1 is completely fine uh, in this structure. Uh, I guess it's up to taste at this point. Uh, he should definitely not take this. This is a poison pawn because if he would have captured with a knight, a very simple uh, tactic. Rook captures if they take with a pawn. Queen to g5 and you have nothing better than blocking with a bishop. I'm going to take that. I'm going to be checkmating you. Okay, that's very standard. So he plays knight to d7. I don't know why. <laughs> I 
I mean, perhaps he's trying to open up the bishop's path and maybe maneuver the knight. But the knight usually plays as an important uh, defender there. So I'm just going to open up my file for the rook, okay? I'm a simple man. I want to get some activity for my rook. He takes with the f-pawn. So just kind of trying to keep my file closed. And so far you notice that uh, in this structure we really afford to not develop these pieces. Not because we're like completely crazy and uh, we hate opening principles in general. But it's simply because uh, we didn't have so many great squares for our pieces. And it's quite often that in this structure the bishop just doesn't move at all. And the knight, if you develop it, usually it's via this route. So if you can start with that right away. Just imagine our knight, uh, we land on g5. It opens up sacrificial ideas such as uh, knight takes on h7. Bishop to f6 is an... <clears throat> pretty weird move in itself because it's not really doing much, but it just makes me wonder for half a second, uh, can I throw in e5? D, E, D, E. I don't see how that immediately wins, so I'm just gonna keep going with my plan. Maybe this, maybe even knight can uh, plant itself on e6. But yeah, he just goes knight f8. This does a good job in like uh, defending against the direct move, but... It also does a terrible job defending against bishop takes. <laughs> so I think we just have a simple way to pick up the pawn. The nice thing about this variation is that we also get to win his bishop or the exchange. Because if he was in time to, like, let's say, uh, keep the bishop <clears throat> without losing the exchange, it wouldn't have been so clear uh, with the extra pawn alone. But now that I'm going to trade this, expecting him to play rook f7... I think uh, this is very much where we wanted him to be. So yeah, queen h6 not very good because of bishop back. So just going to be taking. This is literally his most important piece right now because it's uh, making sure the king is semi-safe. <laughs> I think you can say that. And after pawn takes, now it's that time of the day when uh, we're going to infiltrate. Attacking the pawn, threatening to mate, and... Uh, I'm pretty sure this is just resignable. Because the threat is not to win the pawn or mate, but if you're trying to, let's say, defend against both by playing rook g7, making a queen h8, you're avoiding immediate mate, but I'm going to be talking a little bit with your queen, so I'm not sure you'd like that. Thus, he resigned. Thus, proving why the Jabava London is Magnus' favorite choice against the Fianchero setup. If you made it to this point in the video, you probably fell asleep while watching, which I cannot really blame you for. But in case you really want to boost up your chess or at least the London system understanding, I highly advise you check out the video that will appear on the screen. It is genuinely one of my best uh, London videos that I have ever made, so I can't wait to see you there.